And I'm going to mute everybody on call here. Remember, you are more than welcome to unmute yourself if you'd like to talk. That is, that is awesome to do. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the deep dive Bible study of the book of Genesis here at New Beginnings Christian and Missionary Alliance Church in Poughkeepsie, New York. I'm Pastor Danish House. Tonight is October 5th. October 5th, 2022. And uh, so we're glad that you're here. Uh, we've got folks who are here live and in person. We've got folks who are, yay! We've got folks who are uh, participating by Zoom. And we have uh, folks who are, maybe you're watching this on YouTube after the fact. If that's the case, welcome to you. Um, if you need a copy of our Bible study manuscript, you can send uh, an email to church at newbeginningscma.org. That's church at newbeginningscma.org, and we'll send you a copy of the manuscript. Last week was our first week back to the Bible study after the summer break, and that was because I had some medical problems that delayed it until last week. Um, so I'm glad to be back. I have to say, though, that next Wednesday, I will be in the hospital. So uh, so next Wednesday, there will be no Bible study. Uh, I'll be in the hospital next Wednesday uh, for a surgery. Um, if they don't, they might hold me overnight, but even if they don't, I won't be. Oh, no. So... So yeah, so next week uh, is uh, is a break. So, all right, cool. Uh, last week we were we we talked about the conversation between uh, Jacob and his two wives, Rachel and Leah, as they made the decision that they needed to flee from Jacob's father-in-law Laban and uh, make their way back to the land of Canaan. Uh, Laban had cheated Jacob multiple times, and uh, Jacob felt unsafe, and Rachel and Leah agreed with him. <laughs> they, they were upset with their father as well, and Jacob uh, put, when, when Laban was out shearing the sheep, and so Jacob had some space uh, to do this, Jacob put his property all together, got his wives and kids on camels, and they started fleeing to the land of Canaan. And it ends up by saying that two things. One is that Rachel stole her father's household gods and Jacob stole the heart of Laban the Aramean, which was, it says, translated tricked, but literally it's he stole the heart of Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he intended to flee. So we, we finished last week on page 55 in our manuscript, page 55, um, and it's more than likely line 16. We do have another manuscript. If you're on YouTube, uh, you may have a copy of the manuscript where it's a little bit later. But page 55, line 15, ends with, set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. Uh, set his face toward the hill country of Gilead is where we, uh, we ended up. So um, let's uh, ask the, the big question that we always, let's pray. Let's pray. And then we'll ask the big question. All right, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for our time together tonight. Thank you that uh, you inspired this text uh, to be written and that you have something wonderful to say to us tonight in it and through it. Lord, I pray that you would fill every heart within the sound of my voice with your Holy Spirit, that your spirit might guide us as we examine this text. Um, and we... We look at it and we listen to it, and then we learn how to live it out uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. Lord, I, I pray that you would show us wonderful things in your word tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, we, we're gonna start on page 55, line 15. If you've had the chance to we'll take a look at the text in advance, where do you think this passage ends? Where will we end our study tonight? There's no right or wrong answers on this. Um, I certainly have opinions. Uh, but, uh, but I want to hear from you. Where, where do you think this text, this passage should end? 57. I went. Page 57, what yeah. line? Bottom line. Line 23. Yeah. Page 57, line 23, Laban departed and returned home. Okay. Why did you choose that? The spot? Break. Because they go on their separate way. Jake, Laban's going home and Jacob went on his way. Okay, good. 
Uh, did I hear Bev saying something, Bev? What was what, what was the place that you had? Yeah, I went to I went to fifty seven, but I stopped on line seven. Page fifty seven, fifty seven, line seven. They're my flocks, and all that you see is mine. Or what are the, what are the last words you had? Bev. Maybe you're still muted, I think. What did you say? What were the last words that you had in, the, in this passage? Daughters or for their children whom they have born. Oh, okay. Question mark. Oh, yeah, I was going the wrong line. Okay, great. So that's just before the suggestion of making a covenant. Right, okay. Right. Great. Anybody else have a different spot? Well, to my mind, the covenant is a very important part of this particular passage. So um, I don't want to lose that as part of this passage. I think that uh, where I would like to stop is where uh, Chris selected there, Laban departed and returned home. Um, that is where most of our Bibles end the passage there. It's the end of chapter 31, beginning of chapter 32. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense just to end there. Uh, again, there's other, other things you could do. You can go with that su suggestion. I also looked at going to page 58, line two. So he called the name of that place Mah Mahanaim and Jacob sent messengers through Esau. So we, we have kind of a switch from dealing with Laban to dealing with Esau there. But I, I think it is better to actually uh, leave that as part of the next story. Um, so we're gonna, tonight, it's a long passage. So tonight we're gonna, we're gonna do basically two and a half pages page 55, line 15, to page 57, line 23. Um, I want to give you just a few minutes to read over this passage. If you've done some study in advance, you will be definitely uh, better off, but you'll still benefit from taking some time to read through the passage. And if you haven't done the study, it'll really help you to sort of have read the passage and to start in your observations. Remember that our method of Bible study is three parts, right? It's to look, to listen, and to live, okay? Looking is, is making observations in the texts, asking what does it actually say? And that's what we're gonna take some time to do now. So I'd like you to take your pencils or pens, your markers or crayons, and, uh, read over the text, make observations about uh, comparison and contrast or cause and effect or repetitions. Uh, the, the four journalistic questions, who, what, where, when, why, and how, uh, that make those observations. And then in, in uh, five minutes, we will we'll, we'll start talking about it together. So giving you five minutes, um, Jacob. And for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, I'm going to go sit in that chair there and for five minutes. And when five minutes is up, I'll stand up. So as far as fast forwarding till the end of it, when you see me get up, the time is over.
right. Well, that's five minutes. Obviously, this is a passage that will reward an hour's worth of work in or more. And we're going to work on it together tonight. Um, let's start with our observations and ask the question, what did you see? As you look at this passage, what stood out to you? What did you see in this passage? Pastor? Yes. Could, could I share something uh, that goes back to, I read recently and it goes back to the covenant God made with Abraham? You bet. It's just short. Okay. Names are important in the Bible, often, often reflecting a person's character traits or new role. For instance, God changed the names of Abram and Sarai when he made a covenant of love with them, promising that he would be their God and they would be his people. Abram, which means exalted father, became Abraham, which means father of many and sarai which means princess became sarah which means princess of many god's new names included the gracious promise that they would no longer be childless that's great yeah the names are very important in the bible and names are very important especially in covenant making situations um, I wonder if that will apply here in this passage. Uh, I'm just going to say it is important to this passage, and I can't wait for us to, to discover that today. Thanks, Bev. That's great. In this passage, someone, what's, what's something you observed? What stood out to you uh, in this passage tonight? At the beginning, we have the third day and seven days, and those two numbers turn up a lot. All right, so we have the, the third day and the seventh day. Uh, good observation, good observation. And uh, if you use a map, can anybody use a map to take a look at this journey on a map? From Haran, so, uh, Jacob and Laban both left from Haran and they wound up in the hill country of Gilead. Okay. Uh, on the third day, Laban is told that Jacob has left. So Jacob has a three day head start on Laban. And uh, Laban took seven days to follow him. Here's the rub. Uh, it is 300 or more miles between Haran and Gilead. Now, uh, that means that Jacob, if for, for Laban to catch up with Jacob and for them to stop after seven days of flight, uh, or 10 days of flight, because it's three days plus seven, right? Uh, we're on the 10th day, that's 30 miles a day plus. Um, which to us seems like I'll jump in the car, I'll do 30 miles in, you know, an hour, right? Or 30 miles in 50 or 40 minutes. In Jacob's day, with sheep and goats and camels, with uh, large uh, wagons, right, with their stuff, uh, 30 miles a day was ridiculous. Like you couldn't do that. You could do 20 miles a day, maybe, okay? And for Laban, traveling without all that stuff, it would, he would go a lot faster. Laban might be able to go 30, 40 miles a day. So it's a little tricky. And, and uh, for Bible scholars, even for Bible scholars who want to take the text as written, right? It's a, it's a tricky thing. Why is, there why is it 10 days? How could it possibly be 10 days? Was, I mean, Jacob was obviously motivated, right? But he's driving women and children and sheep. They can only go so fast for so long. And we have a pretty good idea of how fast that is and how long that is because people have been moving sheep for as long as there have been sheep, right? Um, so I think, so let me ask you this. Uh, why might it be significant to that question that the numbers involved are three and seven? 
God rested on the seventh day. Yeah. And Jacob rested on the seventh day. Yeah. Uh, created the, the land, animal land, uh, land, let's spread the land from the sea and uh, create the, uh, and created vegetation on the land. Um, but why might it, so yeah, so, so these are numbers that are significant in the Bible, three and seven. We, way back at the beginning of our study, long, long ago, we did a, a bit on the significance of certain numbers and three and seven are, and 10 are certainly among those numbers that in the Bible have special significance. Um, why might that help us with the question of how fast Jacob was going? Well, we know he's going very fast. Mm -hmm. Trying to put as much distance between him and Laban as possible. Yep, absolutely. He absolutely is. We, we say about these numbers is that they have symbolic meaning, right? And so they, they have a meaning beyond the numbers. Oh. So you'll often see Bible authors rounding to the nearest three, the nearest seven, and the nearest 10, okay? When we have a genealogy with 10 names in the genealogy in one place, we might see in other places that there's 12 or 13 names. And that genealogy has been pruned to get 10 names in the genealogy. Uh, these are used as round numbers in the Bible. Three is used as a round, small round number, seven as an intermediate round number, and 10 as kind of a, a catch-all round number. Um, the, the Bible writer was probably not uh, overly concerned if it was 10 days or 11 days or 12 days. The Bible writer uh, just rounded it to 10. Or Jacob was miraculously teleported and all of his stuff faster than he thought he could. That's not impossible. But uh, I think a more likely explanation is if you look through the Bible, you, you, it's hard to find numbers that aren't 3, 7, or 10, right? Or 6. Or some Exactly, a, a, multiple, a multiple of it, of, of multiplying them together. These are the numbers that the Bible uses. And so I think you should just think of it as around 10 days. And I think that's what the Bible offers is telling you. Good observation. Somebody else, what else did you see? Now I'm wondering if there's anything significant about it being Gilead. Okay. Now I'm thinking, I haven't thought about the numbers, I just went right over my head. But seven would be the completion. Mm -hmm. So maybe it wasn't the amount of days, mm. maybe it was where they were going. Mm -hmm. But okay. I don't know why Gilead would be such a special place. Good question. Well, I don't have an answer for that question. Um, <coughs> but so maybe I'm not right. This, but this is why we recommend the use of a new Bible, of a Bible dictionary. So what I'm going to do, Sue, is I'm going to give you this. I'm going to ask you to look up Gilead and just take a look. Maybe there is a significance that we just don't have the knowledge of in our, in our heads, but scholars have uh, determined. The only thing I can remember about Gilead is that uh, it, it was a sheep area. That's the only thing I can remember about Gilead. Um, but um, I don't remember everything. So good question. Is Gilead a significant place? In the Bible. What's another observation while Sue's looking that up? God came to Laban at night and said, uh, in a dream, mm -hmm. and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob who is with the warpath. God to Laban in a dream, not good or bad. Anything good or bad to Jacob? Uh, what's significant about that? Why? Why does that stand out to you? Uh, I think because uh, Laban in the past would pretty much just shoot off his mouth very quickly. Yeah. yeah. So I think God was just saying in your dream to 
think before you act or say anything. Yeah, yeah. If if God comes to Laban and says, don't say anything to Jacob, good or bad, what does that imply about Jacob and his relationship with God? Special relationship. A special relationship, right? Um, why would what, what is God's intention in saying that to Laban? Okay, yeah. It's protection, right? Uh, Laban now has a word from God that Jacob is under my protection uh, before he encounters Jacob at all, which is important to know because there's going to be stuff that happens that you're like, Laban seems to be pushing his luck here. If, if Jacob's under God's protection, Laban seems to be pushing his luck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Talk to me about these words. Good and bad. It shows up again, right? And Laban tells the story to Jacob on page 56, line three, good and bad are used there. He just recounts what God had said to him. Um, but what do those words remind you of in the book of Genesis? Good and bad. Let me sweeten it a little for you. The word bad, so the word good is in Hebrew is oh. And the word bad is ra'ah. Okay. Ra, yeah, ra. Okay. Now, bad is sometimes translated evil. So if I were to say to you, good and evil in the book of Genesis, what are you thinking? Satan versus God is sort of the, the general conflict. It gets its start, though, at a very particular place, Garden of Eden, Garden the Garden of Eden. And the, where did good and evil show up in the Garden of Eden? The tree, right? There is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Back in Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3, there's the tree of the knowledge of Tov and Yah, Ra, Tov and Ra, okay, good and evil. Um, when Satan tempts Eve, he says, you will be like, if you eat from the fruit of the tree, you will be like God, knowing Tov and Ra, right? When, and then when uh, God uh, encounters Eve afterwards, he says to himself, the man has now become like one of us, knowing Tov and Ra, okay? Tov and Ra, good and evil, is one of the themes of the book of Genesis. And here, God says to Laban, don't say anything Tov or anything Ra to Jacob. Tov and Ra have to do with judging whether something is right or wrong. And Laban is not equipped, right? Why would Laban not be equipped to judge right from wrong? Because he's been cheating Jacob for years. He's a liar, a cheater, and a deceiver, right? Uh, Laban is, is scum of the earth in this, in this uh, book of the Bible. Um, I'm sure if you met Laban in person, he had one, many wonderful qualities, but he doesn't in the book of Genesis, right? Uh, in the book of Genesis, he's just a bad guy, and uh, God says to him, don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad, because he's under my protection, and you don't know what you're talking about. Did you find anything about Gilead? No, not really. It just talks about where exactly it is, how far north, how far south, and different places. And then the only thing it says is that there were uh, different people who sought refuge in Gilead. And uh, among those who sought refuge in Gilead were Jacob when he fled from Laban, the Israelites who feared the Philistines and Saul's time. Uh, Ishbosheth, I don't even know who that is, Son and David during Absalom's revolt. Okay, that's all. So, so it's a place, about. it's considered a place of refuge, no true zone. Okay, oh, that's a good point. That could be yeah. <laughs> a neutral place, a place of refuge. That, that might have that might have significance to this story. Yeah, good, great observation. All right, somebody else. Uh, so we have Tobin Rock. <laughs> what else do you see in this passage? Laban's mad. Laban's mad. How, so why, you're fine. You are a fine reader. 
what are the fine, subtle points that indicate to you that Laban is mad? Mm -hmm. He tries to put Jacob on a guilt trip. He immediately accuses him of all this stuff, despite what God just warned him. Yes, okay, so Laban's not listening to God at all, right? In fact, he's saying bad stuff to Jacob right now. Um, and he's furious. What are some of the things that Laban says that indicate that he's furious? Tricked me. You've tricked me. Yes. Bring away my daughters like captives of the sword. Like captives of the sword. Okay. Uh, these are both, so there's, there's definitely hostility here. Um, but I want to just zoom in on this phrase, captives of the sword. Okay. What does Laban believe his daughters are feeling right now? Oh, that they've been uh, kidnapped. Yeah. Kidnapped, right. You took my daughters away from my safe, wonderful, loving home, right? Mm -hmm. You kidnapped my daughters. Okay, so question. Are they his daughters primarily now? No, they're uh, Jacob's wives. They're Jacob's wives, right? Laban sold his daughters to Jacob as wives, okay? Uh, but in Laban's heart, they're still his daughters. They're not Jacob's wives. Uh, how do Rachel and Leah feel about uh, what their father did? We studied this last week. Yeah, they're angry at him. They're angry. Yeah. They feel like he's treating them like foreigners. You've sold us. You 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 uh, burnt away all our property, and you left us with nothing. They were happy to leave Laban's place. Laban doesn't get it. Okay, Laban throws all this stuff out here, but we've read the story already before. We know what Rachel and Leah are feeling. And so the, the author is kind of, has already given us everything we need to see that Laban is blowing moonshine, right? Laban doesn't know what he's saying here. He is just wrong from beginning to end. Yeah, he says, why didn't you let me send you away with mirth and songs and tambourines and lyre? Uh, why did, does that strike you as, as an unlikely event and why? That's not his personality. Right, right. <laughs> Where, how do we know this? Give that. He wouldn't give that away because that would be taking things away from him. Yes, uh, right. No, he's a skinny. He's very self-centered, very uh, greedy. Yeah, 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 right. Uh, do we have any examples of Laban throwing Jacob a party earlier in Genesis? There is one. Yeah, the wedding. The wedding. He tricked him to marrying. And, okay, right. So the last time he throws the party for no, last time he threw a party for Jacob, Jacob got tricked. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, sure, Laban, we're going to wait around for you to throw us a party. So he just tricked us. Yeah, you can take our shoes. You know, what, what do you want? I mean, come on. Right. And he says, why didn't you let me kiss my sons and my daughters farewell, calling Jacob's children his own? And he says, you have done foolishly. That that's, sounds like a really lame word. In Hebrew, it's really strong, right? He's actually making a very strong uh, accusation here about that Jacob is, the, the word fool in the Bible typically um, fool has is not about what's in your brain, right? Not about what's in your brain, but it's about what's in your heart. Okay, the fool the Bible says has said in his heart there is no God. Okay, there's a there's a moral lack in the fool. It's not that the fool didn't graduate from high school or didn't go to college and get a diploma. It's not that the fool doesn't like to read. Uh, the fool is not intellectually deficient. The fool is morally deficient. And, and this is Laban saying to Jacob that he's morally deficient. Uh, okay. Exactly. Well, yes, thank you. Right. Somebody's got to say it. Uh, Laban it takes one to know what they want. You know, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> uh, you talk about morally deficient. Um, all right. Uh, so then he says, it is in my power to do you harm. True or false? False. Why? God already warned. Yeah. God's protecting Jacob, right? 
right? God's protecting Jacob. Uh, Laban seems less, he's more and more angry, but less and less powerful as he talks. Because everything he says, we know from earlier stories that he, it, he's, he doesn't have a leg to stand on, right? But the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either Tov or Ra. Now you've gone away because you longed greatly for your father's house. Is that why Jacob went away? Why did Jacob no. go away? God told him to. God told him to, yeah. And he was being cheated. <laughs> so he's not longing for his father's house. Laban doesn't even know that. But why did you steal my gods? Okay, so there we go. Uh, and I, I just want to write this up there. Um, we talked about this last week, and we, we put a pin in it. Uh, but the word for gods there is teraphim. Teraphim. And teraphim refers to small idols anywhere from the size of uh, you know, a can of soup to the size of a human being, okay? Uh, there's a, there is one scene in the life of David where David uh, flees from Saul and his wife puts a teraphim in the bed and puts a wig on the teraphim and covers the teraphim over with uh, a blanket so that the guys who come to kill David think that they've killed him, right? So that the teraphim was large enough to pass as David, um, which is interesting if you're, if you're a fan of Lord of the Rings, right? Uh, that, that happens in Lord of the Rings, too, and Tolkien obviously took that idea from the Bible. So, just fun little thing. Okay. So, yeah, we have the teraphim. You stole my gods. Okay. Um, I said let's not talk about it till we got to this passage. We're in this passage. Uh, talk to me about Laban's gods. What do we learn about Laban's gods in this passage? Well, they're idols. They're idols. They're idols. Okay, what else do we learn? Yeah. They're worth something. They're worth seem to be worth more than his daughters. You know, because he's coming and because he's coming after them for his for his idols. Yeah. And he's probably using them for uh, divination. So he uses them for divination. We we've seen that in an earlier passage that he uses these teraphim for divinations. Mm -hmm. What else do we learn about this? What else do we see about the teraphim? Well, they must be small. They must be small. Why do we know that? Because uh, Rachel was sitting on them. Right. So can't, these can't be David-sized teraphim. Right. These have to be soup can-sized teraphim. She's sitting on them on top of the, what is it, a camel or a horse? Yeah. A camel saddle. Right, so no detail is too small in this story, right? The fact that Leah, Rachel Leah and Bilhah and Zilpah and the kids were on camels plays in here. Uh, camel saddle is about the size of, well, about the size of this uh, lectern top, uh, maybe the size of an Amazon box, a small Amazon box, right? Like maybe uh, uh, a foot deep and then a foot and a half by a foot and a half, okay? Uh, it's a, it was a box that was strapped onto a camel, and we would sit on top of the box, and the box would have a shaped saddle on it. Um, but there were hollow places in there that uh, Rachel was able to just put it under there. Um, so what's Rachel's... So uh, I'm going to skip ahead here. Uh, Jacob, what does Jacob say about the, the gods, actually? Well, he said he didn't take them, and then he... Says anyone who finds your God shall not live. Yeah, okay. So he says, go ahead and look for your gods. I didn't take them. And anybody who has it, if you find it in their possession, they're dead. Okay, who has it? Rachel. Rachel. Does Jacob know? No. no. Okay, fear. <laughs> ah! Okay, this should be a point in the story where you're like, uh oh, danger. Right? <laughs> oh. Like, Jacob, I mean, Ra Rachel, by stealing the gods, has sort of created this situation, and Jacob makes it terrifying by saying that whoever took your gods uh, will surely be put to death. Um, so we now should be afraid, as readers, we should be afraid for Rachel, uh, Jacob's favorite wife. So what does Laban do? Well, he 
Oh, he went looking through the tents and do everything he could find. Yeah, yeah, right. So he goes, and and the story is very interesting the way this, the, the writer does it. Right, he looked in the tent of uh, he looked in Jacob's tent. Yeah. Goes to Leah's tent. Goes in the tent of two female servants, but didn't find them. He went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. He's in the last tent. Okay, the gods are in the last tent. It's it builds the suspense. Right. If he went into Rachel's tent first, it wouldn't be as good a story. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He goes into Rachel's tent last. And now nah, that's really awesome. Right. That's cool. That's exciting. He goes into Rachel's tent. And uh, in every tent, he's been feeling around for his household gods. Uh, maybe he is uh, has a difficulty seeing. Or maybe we, we had one earlier story where someone's father tries to find out who they are by feeling who, by feeling them. Yeah. Isaac, right? Isaac, Isaac was, felt Jacob to determine who he was because Isaac's eyesight wasn't good. So here is Laban trusting his senses, just like Isaac trusted his senses, uh, or most of his senses. He didn't trust his, his ears. Um, so he feels around. He comes, <laughs> comes into... Rachel's tent. And what does Rachel say? She said she's she's having her uh, time of the month. Yeah. In her menstrual cycle. Yeah. And she's sitting on the saddle and on the on, on the the terrapin is making them basically unclean. Unclean. Yes. Okay. So in the Bible, uh, anything if you're if you're having your period, if you're woman having your period, anything you sit on. By her having your period is made unclean. So here are Laban's gods. Okay. So uh, Sue said that they're idols, they're false gods. Not only are they idols, not only they're false gods, but they are worthless, right? Because here's Rachel, forgive me, bleeding on these idols, right? And they can't do anything. They don't tell Laban they're there. Hey, Laban, get us out of here. We're being sat on by a menstruating woman. Uh, nope, they're powerless. How does Rachel feel about these gods if she's sitting on them and menstruating? She doesn't care. She doesn't care. Right? These are not, it's not a religious thing for Rachel. Uh, she just wants, we talked about this last week when we were talking about the, the stealing of the gods, but this is Rachel somehow stabbing back at her father in some way. Um, but these gods are nothing. To Rachel, uh, as far as any kind of holiness or religiousness is concerned, and of course, you know, some commentator, one commentator said, if Laban was a woman, he would have checked the saddle. But Laban's not a woman. <laughs> Laban's a, a guy who gets uncomfortable about these things, and so he doesn't even look in the saddle. Um, well, uh, he doesn't find the gods, and what happens with Jacob? Okay. All right, so talk to me about Jacob's anger. We've seen Laban angry, and everything Laban has said has been wrong. He was right about stealing the household gods, but he, was, but he wasn't able to prove it. Okay? But everything else he said was, was absolutely wrong when, as he was speaking in his anger. What about when Jacob speaks out of his anger? Well, he starts telling the truth. Exactly about everything Laban did for him and how he cheated him for the last right. 20 years. Right. And yeah. first asks, what, what are my offenses? What, you know, uh, what is my sin that you caught me for sin? And then, as Chris said, then one by one, one, by one tells him what, what's going on. Yeah, he's what I've done. You've, you've accused me of all this stuff and none of it's true. Let's talk about what you've done. Right. Um, and he actually calls for the kinsmen to pass judgment between them. This is actually legal terminology in the Bible, okay? The terminology that starts getting used here is the terminology of, of the courtroom, trial, witnesses, and evidence, okay? Um, Jacob, uh, as anybody in, the, in those days had the right to do, Jacob called the kinsmen to be a tribunal, and he, he basically wants them to pass judgment on whose tove and whose rod 
in this situation. Um, so he pours out 20 years of frustration uh, that he's kept inside all this time and just lets it all loose on uh, Laban. It was great detail. Yeah, so, so what did you think about the details? What, what are the things that struck you about his testimony? Um, well, he said, I served 14 years for your two daughters, six years for your flock, and you've changed my wages 10 times. Right. And we can assume it doesn't mean you've given me 10 raises. <laughs> exactly. <right? laughs> That's what you <laughs> How about somebody online? What, what else did you see here in this in this outpouring of anger from Jacob? Well, I'll just take the next step and say that Laban wasn't um, saddened by what was said to him. He was outraged and came back and said, "All this is mine, anyhow." Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. right. Great defense, Laban, in front of the, uh, <laughs> the tribunal. Right? Yeah. Oh, they're mine. They're all mine. Right. Oh, okay. But he but Laban uh gives the, the store away uh in his next line, right? He's all this is mine, but why don't we make a covenant? Right? He doesn't want the kinsman to judge. He wants to settle out of court. Because he knows. He knows that Jacob's been telling the truth. Uh, Jacob says, if and I love these phrases, uh, 57 line two. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac, only place in the Bible that that phrase is used is in this passage. The fear of Isaac had not been on my side. You would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Now, we know that this book, Genesis, was likely written by Moses to the people of Israel after they'd escaped from slavery in Egypt, right? They'd been enslaved in Egypt for a large part of 400 years. And it was a time when they were, and the words that are used there is they were afflicted, right? And, uh, and, uh, they, uh, they were had hard toil. It says affliction and toil. And that's the two words that Jacob uses here. He uses affliction and toil. Um, for Moses' first audience, this would have reminded them of their own story, right? And God rebuked Pharaoh. And here was God rebuking Laban. Somebody else. Let's try. Talk to me about the covenant. What do we learn about the covenant on page 57? What, what does the passage say about the covenant? Stones create a pillar, first of all. <laughs> something there to remind future generations of this covenant. Okay, so uh, who, who gathers stone? Jacob. Okay. And then he also said his, his kinsmen gather stone. Okay, does Jacob gather stones? No, a stone. A stone. Okay, so Jacob takes a stone and sets it up as a pillar. Okay. And then they, presumably Laban's kinsmen, gather stones and set them up as a heap. Okay? So we've got two pillars, Jacob's pillar and Laban's pillar at the start of this covenant. Okay? So just, and, the, and, and what is the point of these pillars? Be a witness. A witness. Okay, so these pillars are a witness. What does that mean? They're a witness. Third party. Third. Witness between the first contract. Right. Okay, they're watching. They're watching. These stones are watching us. I'm surprised that Jacob wouldn't agree with us. Why? 
because he's being tricked. He's always being tricked. So why in the world would he think well, that okay. David is the artist? That's a great question. A That's a great that. question. Well, let's setting him up again. As we go, as we go along, let's have, let's keep that question in our minds. Okay, it's good. It's important. That's an important question. Um, because how Jacob perceives this is not how Laban perceives this. Jacob and Laban have two. Laban have two different ideas about what's going on oh, yeah. here, and and so it's important to ask that question. What does Jacob think is going on here? He's so naive. <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with that, but he is he is participating in something that uh, where he believes it's different than Laban does. So they set up two different pillars, um, and then they eat. Okay, they eat. Okay, let's talk about eating. Before that, uh, Laban brings in God as a witness too. Before, so he's it's just uh, God is witness between you and me. In line eight, well, in line uh, 10, 11, uh, 12, the okay. Lord watch between you and me when we are out in one another's state, uh, sight. Okay, well, and then in fifteen, God is witness between you and me. Well, let's let's get to that in just a second. We'll get to what, what Laban says in a second, because that's you you got your finger on something, but I don't think you saw it correctly. Right. Before that, he says, come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and yeah. let it be a witness between you and me. All right. So the covenant is a witness, right? The covenant is the thing that we're going to be judged, that our behavior will be judged by. Okay. We're going to have the covenant as, a, as something that will be judged by. Now, a covenant in the ancient day... Uh, took specific forms. And you might not know this just uh, from your everyday life. So I'm gonna give you some background. You can find this stuff in the New Bible Commentary. You can find it in the New Bible Dictionary. It's pretty common knowledge, but, uh, but you have to go looking for it and you might not come right out of the text. But you'll see what's happening in the text clearly by seeing what happens in covenants. First off, covenants involve, covenant always involve, um, two major features, okay? One is an oath, sort of a solemn promise, okay? And the other is a sign, some physical thing that you did to depict the making of the covenant. There might be multiple oaths, there might be multiple signs, but there's always at least one oath and at least one sign, okay? Um, and uh, some common signs uh, might be sacrifice, taking an animal, cutting it into pieces, and saying, if you violate this covenant, may you be like this animal. They need to be cut in pieces. Okay? So that's, that is one common sign. It depicts the punishment for violating the covenant. Um, it might be um, a name change. This is something that uh, Bev was saying at the beginning of our, of our time. Uh, it's very common in a covenant for each covenant partner to get a new name. Because it's, it's, and marriage is a very strong covenant, right? And, and names change in marriage. There's an oath in marriage. And there's a sign, sexual union. In, uh, in marriage, as well as the name change in marriage. There's many signs in marriage. There's the wedding ring in marriage for us today. Um, so yeah, you see this in the covenant of marriage too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but a name change is, it symbolizes the making of a new family, right? We're, we're not part of a new family. And another common sign is a meal. There are many covenants. People will sit down and have a meal together. What does sitting down and having a meal together symbolize about the covenant. Well, I mean, we, we usually say we break bread together. Mm. So that means that we share a meal uh, and that brings the two parties together. Exactly, exactly, yes. So breaking bread together, having that covenant meal together, it's a, it's a sign of unity, right? We are now part of the same, you, the people you normally eat with are your family, right? Uh, sometimes you have holidays and you have a lot of family, right? And when you invite someone to be part of your holiday meal, it's a tremendous honor, right? You're, you're including them in your family. 
Um, I know that uh, at, at co when I worked on the college campus, our international students who were far from home, inviting them home for Thanksgiving dinner was a powerful thing for them because they felt like they were part of your family, right? Eating a meal together is a symbol of, of union and unity and, and fa a family-like relationship being established. So here, the, Jacob uh, sets up a pillar, his kinsmen set up stones and they eat a meal uh, there by the heap. So the heap is, um, the heap is Laban's pillar. So when we, when we say the word heap, we're talking about Laban's pillar. So this is a meal that Laban hosts, okay? Laban hosts here a meal by the heap. All right, what else happens? We have some name, we have some naming that happens. What do, what do we learn about the names? Well, they both name the place a different place. Yeah, okay, so Laban in Aramaic names the place Jegar Sahaduta, which means this heap is a witness. Okay, that's what it means. But Jacob names it in Hebrew. He names it Galid, which means this heap is a witness. Okay, so we have now, we have two heaps with two names. Okay, the two names are in two different languages. So this is a cross-cultural covenant. Uh, Laban identifies more strongly as an Aramean. As, as, that's why he speaks Aramaic. But Jacob speaks Hebrew, and he calls him, he, he identifies as a Hebrew. Um, Laban said, this heap, Jagar Sahadutha, is a witness between me and you and me today. Okay, so then it says, therefore, he named it Galid. Who's the he? Assuming Laban. Laban? Laban doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, right? Because no. Laban didn't name it Galid. Jacob named it's it Jacob. Galid. So, Jake, so that he is probably referring to Jacob, even though grammatically it's not really strong. Therefore, Jacob named it Galid and Mitzvah. Now, Mitzvah means watch. Okay, or guard. Uh, so Jacob gives it a, a, this place a second name, Mitzvah, uh, that's there. Uh, now, this is a little funny thing in Christianity. Uh, it is very common for Christians to have, uh, give as gifts, uh, this next verse, uh, a plaque mm -hmm. with this next verse. A lot of Christians will engrave this verse on their wedding rings, right? And what does it say? The Lord watch between you and me when we are out of one another's sight. That's so sweet, isn't it? I and mean, that's just a nice, lovely, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, that's not what they're saying at all. Right? They're not saying, oh, we're cozy. It's like, if you do bad, the Lord's going to kill you. And I, I can't watch you all the time. So I'm going to get God to watch you when I'm not around. Right. Uh, this is I don't know. I mean, this is one of the places where Christians just take the Bible out of context because it sounds nice. Um, it's just like there was a verse of the day uh, ca a calendar that I saw online. And one of the days, the, the, the verse that was quoted was, if you bow down to me, all the kingdoms on earth will be yours. That's a positive, what a positive <laughs> encouragement from the Bible until you realize who said it. Right. <laughs> Jesus. Right. It's like, okay, Christians, pay attention to your Bible. <laughs> the Lord watched between you and me when we were out of one another's sight. Jacob is saying, look, this is, and this is Laban, right? He says, if you oppress my daughters, or if you take wives beside my daughters, although no one is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Um, but isn't it um, the Jewish thing, this stuff? Isn't that the box that they put on the outside of the house with that scripture, the Lord watch between you and me while we are absent one from the other? Is that what's on the, in the box? Yeah, I think so. No, I did not know. And I thought it was supposed to be a good thing that God is watching over you 
In this case, in this case, it's watching not. over you. In this case, it's in not. case you do right. something wrong, like whoa, he's going to get you. Right. right. But right. I think normally, well, I guess it's been changed, but maybe not in the Bible. Maybe people have just changed it. Hmm. So, yeah. so Laban sees this pillar as the Lord will will watch to make sure you're not doing anything wrong. Jacob sees this as a place of judgment. Uh, well, Jacob swear, uh, so yeah. Um, Jacob has no intention of doing Laban any harm, right? Uh, but he's just as glad for the pillar as as Laban is, but not because he plans to do Laban harm, but because Laban has spent twenty years harming him. It means a very different thing to Jacob than to Laban. Laban is aggrieved wrongly. Jacob is aggrieved rightly. Uh, and for both of them, they take some comfort from this pillar. Um, now, uh, Laban says, the God of Abraham, line uh, 18, the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, it was Abraham's father, the God of their father judge between us. Um, actually, the word God there, the God of their father, is, is probably plural the gods of their fathers, because the word judge is plural as well. So um, Laban thinks there are two gods at this uh, ceremony, okay? There's, there's Jacob's God and there's Laban's gods. Uh, Laban's perspective is, look, your gods will watch over me, my gods will watch over you, and we're all set. But Jacob doesn't see it that way at all. Instead, in line 19, so Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac um, and offered a sacrifice there in the hill country. Jacob didn't see it at all as being about Laban's gods. He saw it as being about the one God who is watching over all. And then Jacob calls his kinsmen to do what? Bread. Eat bread. So we have a second meal. We had one meal where Laban was the host, and now we have one meal where Jacob is the host. So this covenant is sworn with an oath, and it is symbolized by the pillars and by the meals that they enjoy uh, together there. Then Laban, early in the morning, uh, gets up, kisses his grandchildren and his daughters, and blesses them, and then departs and returns home. So, uh, Laban got nothing that he wanted. Jacob got everything. Here we go, right? This is a is a beautiful covenant that is 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 made here, but it's a couple, it's a non-aggression pact between two guys who uh, are master tricksters, right? And uh, and we, as far as we know, neither Laban nor Jacob ever crossed that way again. Um, and Mitzvah winds up being on the border between Israel and Syria. Um, and uh, it winds up being, as many border towns are, it wound up being a place where uh, people where Arameans and, uh, and uh, Jews uh, mixed, intermarried sometimes, and uh, had basically peaceful relations there. So this becomes sort of that uh, peacemaking place that we sort of saw Gilead as kind of a, a, a neutral zone. There's a lot more that we can see here. Uh, we, we went through it really quickly. We need to move from looking to listening. Um, so let's do that, right? So we look, we observe, we listen, we interpret, right? We ask the question, what does this passage mean? What does this mean? So taking everything that we've looked at, okay, in this passage, what would you say this passage is trying to teach. What is the theme? What are the themes that this passage is trying to teach? I think that you might go through a lot of trials and tribulations, but if for your life, if you continue on the right road, the Lord will reward you in some way. The Lord rewards faithfulness. Uh, 
the end, uh, Jacob, you know, got everything he wanted out of this, and uh, he was not the most faithful person at the beginning of our story. But here, we definitely see him taking strong, godly steps. Yeah. What else? Yeah, I, I, I think that's even stronger here, is the, the idea that God protects uh, those that he has has chosen to be his. Jacob uh, wasn't faithful when God chose to protect him. In fact, when God chose to protect Jacob, Jacob was a, uh, a jerk. I was, at, I, t- I was teaching at Upton Lake Christian School uh, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, just before I went to the hospital, actually. Uh, I was teaching uh, there at a, 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 um, a, a, their chapel service, and I taught about Jacob and and the uh, and the Bethel, the place where he saw the ladder going up to heaven. And I said to them, I said to the students at the Christian school, I said, and Jacob was just he was a jerk, and unlike all these little kindergartners were like, <laughs> 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 and I, in my head I'm thinking, you should have heard the word I was thinking. That wasn't even the word I was thinking. I, I scandalized the Christian school by using the word jerk. You said the word. We're not supposed to say. The Lord, the Lord rewards and the Lord protects. Absolutely. Anything else? What else do you see as far as themes of this passage? Yeah, okay. You meant for evil, God meant for good. This will be the theme of the book of Genesis at the end. This, when we get to the end of the book of Genesis, this will literally be the thing that sort of wraps everything together. Um, but we do see it along the way. And, and these, th- this theme is here. Laban means evil for Jacob. But God is rewarding and protecting Jacob, and, and God is the one whose intention comes to pass, not Laban's. Um, I want to ask, what do you see about anger in this passage? Because both Laban and Jacob get angry. So I want to just tease out here, is there anything we can learn about anger in this passage? Maybe somebody online on Zoom might want to comment. What do we learn about anger here? Some anger is justified. Okay. I'm going to go over here for that. Some anger is justified. Okay. You sounded like you were giving me the first half of a sentence. <laughs> and some anger is unjustified. <laughs> so what do we learn about justified anger and unjustified anger? Like what, what's the result of, of unjustified anger? Trouble, usually. Right. Um, the Bible says the anger of man does not produce the, the fruit of God. Right? Uh, it, it, it's, it becomes trouble. And what, do we, what happens from Jacob's justified anger? Jacob turned out good for him. Things turn out okay. Not because of his anger, um, but they do turn out okay for him. Um, the, the central component here seems to be whether or not they're telling the truth, okay? Mm-hmm. Laban has somehow uh, tricked himself into believing a lie, and he's furious about that lie. Jacob has been holding in the truth for a long time, <laughs> and here he comes out with the truth. Uh, now, I'm not going to make the point here, so only be angry when you're justified. Because the one thing, the other thing we learn about anger in the Bible is that everybody always thinks their anger is justified, right? <laughs> Laban thought his anger was justified. Uh, so did Jacob. But Jacob, Jacob was operating out of the truth. But what makes Jacob's anger, in a sense, okay, is that God is the one who has affirmed the things that Jacob is saying. 
earlier in the passage, the previous passage, uh, God, God gives, God says to Jacob, I have seen what Laban has done to you, right? God, has, Jacob is speaking the truth of God in that exchange. Um, so at the very least, you got to uh, bring your anger in line with the truth of God, right? Um, even though it is very easy to deceive yourself that your anger is justified in the eyes of God. I don't fully, I didn't come into this full, with a fully realized idea about this, but I think that anger is something that this passage addresses. Um, it's certainly not the only passage in the Bible to address it. Anything else? Any other themes that you see in this passage? Well, if you reap what you sow. Okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, so in some ways that the Lord's rewarding faithfulness you know, and, and the flip side of that is, you know, Lord punishes wickedness. And we we talked about this last week that um, last week was very much about sowing and reaping, right? Yeah. And one of the things that we said, and I, I want to say it again because I think it's important, is that the Bible indicates that you do reap what you sow as kind of the, the basic law of the world. The Bible also indicates that sometimes you don't reap what you sow. And when that happens, it's God's grace. And the message of the gospel, of course, is that Jesus does not treat us as our sins deserve, that Jesus actually dies on our behalf and uh, forgives us our sins. And that's the, that's the grace of the Bible. The, the norm is that you reap what you sow, but when God steps in, suddenly we see grace. There's also grace in this passage, too. Okay. Because Laman walks away with... There wasn't much recognition against Laman. Right. I mean, he just basically walked away and said, okay, yep. that was a move. Um, so there was a lot of grace there. Yeah. The Lord could have done a lot different. Especially when the Lord said, don't say anything to Jacob, tov or ra, and, mm -hmm. and Laban comes and does. Right. Know? Laban's disobeying God, and God lets it slide because God is protecting Jacob, and and the truth of God is, is able to prevail. Yeah, so they've been, Laban received some grace there. Absolutely. He could have been a, a grease smear on the on the Mitzvah hillside. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh let's take a, a couple of minutes and move on to the live, right? If we if looking is observing, listening is interpreting, living is applying. You know, apply the text to our lives. Um and here we ask the question, if, if in the second one we ask, what is this passage trying to teach? Here we ask the question, why did God want me to hear that now? Okay, what is it, why did God want to make sure that I was in this Bible study today? Whether you're here on Zoom or you're watching on YouTube after the fact or you're here in the room right now, um, why did God want you to participate in this Bible study tonight? What's his word to you tonight? I want to take a couple of minutes, give you just a chance to write something down, to listen to God and write something down. If you hear from him, what he's trying to say to you.
right. As you've been, uh, as our, our, our practice is in this Bible study, nobody is required to share. Um, but if you want to share, if, if God said something to you and you want to share it with everybody else, now is the time. What has God said to you tonight? Pastor? Yes. Um, what I got out of it is that you can be good to others, but you have to be careful because they would turn on you mm. and that God is always watching and protecting you. Very good, Janet. That's great. Yeah, God is our vindicator, right? God watches, God sees, and God vindicates. That's a wonderful comfort because people do treat us badly. Praise God. Somebody else. What did God say to you tonight? Well, I think because God is always watching and, and judging, we should uh, strive to be as truthful and honest and fair in your dealings with others as you can be. Okay. Uh, so even without a heat, God is watching. And, uh, and we need to live like God's watching every day. Somebody else. As I was listening to the Lord, I was thinking through my my growing up time. I grew up in a home where anger was not expressed in a healthy way. Um, uh, my mom had one way of expressing anger. My father had a different way of expressing anger. And neither one was particularly healthy. And I didn't, and I grew up as a result of it. I grew up uh, resolving not to ever be angry. And uh, because I saw, and especially with my dad, I saw that when my dad was angry and he exploded, uh, he just lost all credibility. As soon as he exploded, it's like he would, he'd lost the, he'd lost the argument. As soon as he, because I was like, I'm never going to do that. I'm always going to be at calm. Always gonna because it's only when you're calm that you can win an argument, right? And that's what I that's what I took out of my childhood. I'll tell you, that's a really I it gave me a really messed up view of anger, and I don't do anger very well. I remember seeing a counselor at one point, and they were interviewing me for my for the first counseling session, and uh, I felt that they had uh, cheated me. Actually, in the first session, uh, it was they had. They had I came in and I did some tests and I paid for that visit. Then I came in and the second visit, I met with someone who was definitely not going to be my counselor, but they were trying to find me, channel me to the right counselor. And at one point I was like, look, I, I'm angry because I feel like you guys are, are charging me for things that shouldn't be charged. And the, the guy looked at me and he said, Danish, you don't look angry. I asked, well, I am angry. He said, no, you're you're not yelling. You're not. You're, you're very calm. What? You're not angry. And it made me even angrier. <laughs> uh, but I, I didn't know how to express it. I didn't know how to express anger. To this day, I have a very hard time expressing anger. I don't know how to express anger. When I listen to this passage and I see that uh, you know, Jacob had to conform his anger to the truth. Um, I, I know that that's something that God needs to do in my life. God needs to conform my anger to his truth. And you know, there's, there's good things about surrendering your anger, anger to the Lord and letting God be the one who, who uh, defends your cause. But, uh, but part of that is not letting go of, of the truth of a situation. Uh, it, it's easy for me when I feel angry and not want to express it, to just push the whole thing under the rug and pretend like it never happened. And that's not what Jacob does here. Jacob brings it all out. Um, so it's, it's an area of growth for me. It's learning how to express, how to express anger. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm taking this as a word to me to keep working on. I can really relate to that. I wrote down, um, not all anger is bad. Mm. Because from my childhood, we were not allowed to be angry. We were never allowed to be angry. So what happened through my years of growing up was I was afraid of anger. I didn't know what it was. I don't think I had never, ever heard my parents, either one of my parents, 
ever raise their voice, mm -hmm. never. And so whatever anger was, it was so bad mm -hmm. that you just couldn't even like just push it out of your house. Right. Like, no, 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 no. And I remember um, when I was going through my divorce and I was in therapy and one day the, the therapist said, uh, so we were talking about something and, and the therapist said, well, how does it make you feel? Are you angry? And my immediate response was, no, yeah. no, I'm not mad. No, 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 I never get mad. And the therapist was like, what is wrong with you? What's the matter with you? <laughs> no, no, you're not allowed to be mad. So no, no, no. Yep. I can identify with that too. Yeah. Although in my family, it was expressed regularly. But um, yeah, anger is a hard emotion to channel properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. One way or the other, right? Yeah. It's usually destructive. Um, the Bible is pretty clear that anger, uh, human anger, typically results in bad things. Um, but it doesn't mean that you then deny that you are angry. It no, means that Bible you take says, your anger. Your anger do not sin. Right. And and that means mm -hmm. submitting it to yeah. God. Submit your anger right. to God. So you can be angry if you just go to sin. It's hard to do. Yeah, yeah, it's a hard yeah. line to find. There's a great book that I read. It's called Unoffendable by Brant Hansen, and he talks there about giving up the right to be angry. And I don't, I don't think he means the feeling of anger, but I think he means the the, the angry response. And uh, that's a really powerful book. Mm -hmm. Let's. Uh, does anybody else have something you'd like to share? Then let's go to the Lord in prayer and commit this time to Him. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for speaking to us tonight through your word. And it's a, it's a story that is 4,000 years old, and yet uh, it feels so real and so relevant to us today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take what we've heard tonight and, and, and uh, put it into our hearts as, as seed into good soil. Help us to water it and to tend it and to let it grow and bear fruit in our lives. Lord, you are a good God, and you speak to us, and we're grateful for it. Thanks for our time in the Word tonight. Thank you for the contributions that everyone had tonight. Uh, it's, it's so wonderful to, to hear your Word coming out of each person's mouth and, and learning from each other. God, I pray that you would watch between us as we are apart uh, in a good way. <laughs> in Jesus' name, amen. All right, online folks. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm going to stop the recording.